Today is our communion service. After we are done here, we will leave the sanctuary and we will break up. Uh, the men will go straight down the hallway into the fellowship hall. The women will be out there in the blue door. Um, when we come back in, please remember to sit in every other seat so that the deacons have enough room to serve us. Um, turn to Isaiah. So let's look at this a little bit closer, and this won't take long. Isaiah 53. You love the first part. Verse 2, For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, that when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Why do you think that there is no physical beauty there that would attract the attention of a man? Say it loud, you're right. That was not what he was here for, in the look at his heart. When Jesus came on the scene, and when he preached the gospel, that's what the focus was supposed to be on and needed to be on. It was the good news. The message that God has visited man, and that God has made a way for man to be redeemed. So that man could be taken from his hopeless estate to now be brought back into a place where God can use him for God's own glory. Now listen, if you were in the Sabbath school class, it was a beautiful Sabbath school class this morning. I want you to think about what God has done for us. I've said this before, but it bears repeating. God, we're told from Scripture, created man higher than the angels or lower than the angels? Do you understand what Christ has done for you in the redemption of mankind? Yeah. If Adam and Eve never sinned, then throughout eternity would they be higher than the angels or lower than the angels? Do you realize that Christ in coming and becoming a part of mankind, and God says it's a what? A gift? And this gift is to last throughout all eternity. When Christ became one of us, He will stay one of us throughout all eternity. Now, I want you to understand what that means. That means if Adam and Eve never sinned, throughout all eternity they would have had their place. But because they fell, and they fell into sin, and now they went from a little lower than the angels to now being fallen, and hopeless and in and of themselves having no way to escape the slavery of sin. That Christ came for you and I, became part of our race, and now lifted us up higher above the angels. Because he tells you in Scripture that you will be co-heirs with Christ. What does that mean? Any ideas? The inheritance, but co-heirs with Christ throughout all eternity. Christ has raised you and put you in an exalted place higher than what Adam and Eve were before they ever sinned. Do you understand that? Do you grasp that? Do you realize what God has done for you? 
Listen, we may have an enemy, and we may turn around and do something good for that enemy, but how many of us would actually take that enemy and exalt him to a place higher than what he was before? Because that's what God has done for you and I. Do you understand the depths of our depravity without Christ and the exalted position that we find ourselves in in Christ? Think about that. And it's not just for this short life. It is for all eternity. Which of the angels can say that Christ has become one of us? You will have a testimony to share throughout all the eons of time that angels will love to sit down at your feet and listen to. Because you have an experience with their creator that they'll never have. You have a depth of a relationship with Jesus Christ that they can only look into. Understand what God has done for you. And let that carry you through the dark trials of this life. As we celebrate communion this morning, we have to grasp and understand what it took for God to reconcile us back to Him. Was it, was it an easy thing for the Father to give up His Son? In my years of Catholicism, I never grasped nor understood the sacrifice that Christ actually made for me. Because there were so many layers of other things there, mainly the intercession of saints and all this stuff that you had to get through to actually get to Christ and to God that I never actually understood what it was that God did for me through <laughs> Jesus Christ and what it cost Him. Do you realize that in God's plan, does God want anyone to be lost? No. Do you realize that in God's plan, the only one that would ever taste hell would be God Himself? And the angels that fell. God never planned for any human being to ever face the second death. But if you are a Christian and you are in Christ, you can go through this entire life and never have to worry about the second death. Never have to worry about the eternal punishment that is rightly ours. Because Christ came and took all that away. Amen. And when we eat that little piece of bread, and we drink that little cup of wine. It symbolizes what it cost to redeem us. That the Father was willing, as you find here in Isaiah, and this is where we're closed this morning. Turn back to Isaiah 53. What did it cost the Father and the Son? Jesus said, I and my Father are what? One. If you have seen me, then you have seen who? The Father. That the Son didn't do anything of His own authority, but what He heard from the Father, that is what He did. So whatever the Son felt, did the Father feel it? Yes. Did the Spirit feel it? Yes. Were they one? Yes. <clears throat> this is where we'll close at. I want you to think about what is... Uh, written here. Let's look at verse 4. Surely He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed Him what? Stricken. Stricken. Smitten by God and afflicted. Verse 5, I love verse 5, but He was wounded for our what? Yes. And He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement, what does that word chastisement mean? A punishment. A punishment that we deserved was given to Him so that the righteousness that we don't deserve is given to us. <laughs> the chastisement of our peace. I always had a hard time understanding what that meant. 
because chastisement means beating. <coughs> punishment. What's the punishment? The chastisement of our peace. What the, that's a strange way to word that. Why do you think it's worded that way? Because there is a penalty that has to be paid for disobeying God, right? The wages of sin is what? Amen. And God was the only one who could make a way to actually take our punishment. How did he do it? By taking it himself. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. Now listen. We all like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid upon who? Yeah. <laughs> on him. That's Jesus. The iniquity of us. Aren't you glad for that small little word, all? Does it leave anybody out? In Christ, salvation. Full and free. And it's open to everyone. The Lord laid upon him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who would declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living, and for the transgressions of my people he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. I can hardly read verse 10. Have you thought about verse 10? Have you really meditated on this one verse? This, brothers and sisters, is the gospel. Yet it pleased who? It pleased the Lord to bruise him. They were one. They always had been one from eternity past. And yet it pleased God to afflict his own son. To pour out not just anger, but the entire punishment for the sins of the world. What hell is. Do you understand that? What is hell? Hell is the punishment for sin. And it was created for the devil and his angels. But when Adam sinned, now his descendants were to receive that punishment as well. And God said, no, I love them so much that I will send my son. And I will pour out hell itself on him so that you will never taste it. Do you understand how much God loves you? Do you understand now why God will have a people before he comes who will be able to stand without a mediator because they have put their entire focus and trust in him and on him and they will finally understand and live out the faith As you take this communion, think of these things. Think of what God has done for you. And think of what God can do in you and through you. You've got two choices. Those choices are, do you want to see Jesus in death? Are you one of those who say, I don't want to go through the time of trouble? Or do you see this as an opportunity to be able to have God work out His will in you to show not just this world but the entire universe that God has always been true and just and righteous and that He is able to save to the uttermost those that come to Him through His Son, Jesus Christ. Do you want to see God come back? Do you want to be alive when Jesus comes back? Are you willing to allow God to allow you to grow into His character so that when He looks down, He says, Yes, I have a people. Yes, I'm ready to come back. 
when I think about Jesus looking at me, that's what I want him to see. I want to submit to him. As we close this morning and as we leave, again, the men will go into the social hall, the women into the blue door. As we come back, please sit in every other seat so that the deacons can wait upon us.